Hello, and welcome to the history of Rome. For as far back as I can remember, Christmas has been celebrated on the 25th of December. I'm sure this is true for most of you. And in fact, unless one of you out there is 1,700 years old, I'd wager that this was true for all of you. Christmas, as we all know, is officially the birth date of Jesus Christ. But how was it that the 25th of December was chosen from all the dates on the calendar when there is no mention in the Bible as to the exact date of his birth? The 25th of December. Pretty random. Where did that come from? I guess we'd be pretty far off topic if the Romans didn't have something to do with it, so I suppose it won't come as a shock when I say that the Romans had something to do with it. But we have to go back a little further than the Romans even and work out a little astronomy first to really understand the significance of the date. For as long as there has been civilization, there have been holidays and festivals. Days or weeks where work was put aside in honor of this or that god and to celebrate this or that seasonal transition. The particulars change over time and place, but there are a few constants that seem to pop up over and over again, not just in Western civilization, but everywhere. For example, some sort of holiday or festival is invariably found at the beginning of spring in celebration of the return of life from its long winter dormancy. In agricultural societies, there is inevitably some sort of harvest festival, with communities feasting on the recently hauled-in bounty. And of course, across time and space, back to the earliest tribes of mankind, there has been some sort of midwinter festival. And the midwinter festival, whatever the particular rituals or traditions, is always amongst the most popular and most anticipated. Waxing somewhat philosophical on the subject, I believe the midwinter festival is omnipresent and omni-loved because it's, well, in the middle of winter. It's cold and dark, and there's nothing to do. It's been cold and dark for months, and it will be cold and dark for months to come. Without some kind of pleasant break, people are liable to despair. So communities started gathering around fires and throwing week-long feasts, giving each other presents and decorating everything in sight, all in an effort to break up the dreary months. These days, December is marked by an explosion of colored lights in windows, doorways, and rooftops. I can't help but think that this is a psychological reaction to the dull, gray, colorless winter. I always saw midwinter festivities as a prime example of humans throwing a party just because. It's the middle of winter, for crying out loud. Let's have some fun. But there was always a harsh undercurrent as well. In early societies that lived on the razor's edge between survival and extinction, the winter was known as a time of famine. Any excess livestock had to be killed off before the truly hard months set in. The meat could be saved, but there was no point in having an excess number of mouths to feed. Accompanying this slaughter and the copious amounts of meat it produced were the communal feasts, sort of a last blowout before the rationing set in. But midwinter partying for its own sake is, of course, only part of the story. Just as humans have always been finding excuses to have holidays, we have also always had a strange fixation with astronomy. I am not going to bore you with my thoughts on the root causes of that particular obsession, but let's just say that humans love staring at the sky. It did not take long for early astronomers, who, of course, doubled as early priests and shaman, to note cyclical patterns in the movements of celestial objects and begin to attach significance to a few of the more noteworthy points in those patterns. They watched as the days grew longer and longer through the summer until there was a period when the day reached some kind of maximum length and then began to shorten. Later, there was a moment when the day and night were exactly the same length, and then, as winter came, the night began to last longer than the day until it reached some sort of peak length and contracted back to a day and night of equal lengths. People began to wrap up all kinds of religious and philosophical meaning in these days, what we now call the summer solstice, the autumnal equinox, the winter solstice, and the vernal equinox. They had no idea about solar systems and tilted axes and revolving spheres floating in space, but they knew something was up and wanted to get in on the action. So they started surrounding these important days with rituals, ceremonies, and, you guessed it, festivals. So now we'll narrow our focus a bit 
and zoom in on the winter solstice in particular. If humans didn't need a reason to party in the middle of winter in the first place, it certainly wasn't going to bother anyone that now there was. Here the astronomer priests were, telling them that on this one particular day, the darkness that had been spreading for the last six months, bumming everyone out, had reached its maximum ebb, and now the light would be ascendant. The worst was behind them, and from here on out, every day would be a little bit lighter and a little bit warmer, rather than a little darker and a little colder. And if that isn't a reason to invent distillation, I don't know what is. So the midwinter festivities began to occur on and around the winter solstice, just as the spring festivals began to hinge on the vernal equinox. And by the time the Romans came along then, there was already a rich tradition of festivities surrounding the winter solstice. They didn't invent anything, but they did have their own holiday calendar, which became the conduit through which these ancient celebrations passed into our own modern era. A long-standing Roman winter tradition, dating to the early Republic, was called Saturnalia, a feast commemorating the founding of the Temple of Saturn. At first, the celebration took place on December 17, but as time passed, Saturnalia grew to encompass a whole week, generally ending on December 23rd, but by the Middle Imperial period sometimes extending as far as our date of inquiry, December 25th. Saturnalia was by far the most popular of Roman holidays and came complete with large public feasts and a complete abandonment of traditional morality, always a must for the really good parties. Gambling was encouraged where, for the rest of the year, it was frowned upon, and it was encouraged not just for citizens, but for slaves as well, who were treated for the week as real, actual people. In fact, in many cases, a sort of role reversal game was played where the slaves were treated as master and the master as slave. Roman citizens delighted in the novelty of serving food and running errands, while the slaves enjoyed a brief moment on the couch, humorously ordering their owners about. <laughs> Those crazy Romans, what will they think of next? As for its connection to Christmas, Saturnalia was also accompanied by gift-giving, the hanging of pine bows inside the home, and singing in the streets, which corresponds roughly to our caroling, though the Romans apparently did this while drunk and naked, which, I am thankful to say, is a tradition that died with the empire. But for all its importance and obvious similarities to Christmas, Saturnalia was not the true reason Christmas is celebrated on December 25th. That honor goes to an imported Syrian feast called Sol Invictus, or the Feast of the Unconquered Sun. In the Middle Late Imperium, the Romans began to embrace Eastern sun cults and adopted many of their corresponding rituals and holidays. And when we're talking about worshipping sun gods, the winter solstice is obviously going to be seen as a date of great importance. Sol Invictus honored the sun god for holding fast against the encroaching darkness and celebrated the day he turned the tables on his eternal enemy night and began to retake the sky. The Syrian-born emperor Elagabalus introduced the Romans to the feast around 220 AD and held it every year on December the 25th, which, according to the Roman calendar at the time, was the date of the all-important winter solstice. Fifty years later, the Emperor Aurelian, whose patron god was Sol, one of the various sun gods hanging around at the time, popularized the feast and made it an empire-wide holiday. Twenty-odd years after Aurelian, Constantine came along, and I think that we all know what happened next. Seized with either a mystical vision of Christ, or a rather practical understanding that Christian bureaucrats were the only ones who could be trusted with the imperial treasury, Constantine officially ended the persecution of Christians, and on his deathbed converted himself and the empire to Christianity. In the beginning of the Christian era, the leaders of the church attempted to stamp out the old pagan holidays, but ran into a great deal of resistance from the citizens of Rome, who continued to follow their old holiday calendar, holding fast to Sol Invictus in particular. The church elders, realizing they were fighting a losing battle, changed their strategy, and rather than attempting to stamp out the pagan holidays, simply co-opted them and refashioned them as Christian celebrations. The first official connections between Christmas and December 25th began to appear around 330 to 350 AD, Jesus was often depicted during these years with a radiating solar crown 
and was often used interchangeably with the various pagan solar deities by a citizen body transitioning between religions. By 400, December 25th was firmly established as a celebration of the birth of Jesus, and all mention of the old gods was gone. As the empire fell, taking the last vestiges of paganism with it, Roman Catholicism stood as the last bulwark of civilization, and despite the many past claims by other deities to December 25th and the winter solstice, it was now a date for Jesus and Jesus alone. Though the importance of Christmas Day itself as a holiday has waxed and waned over the years, it was always considered the birthday of Jesus, just as it is today when, as a holiday, it now dominates the Christian holiday calendar. So there you have it. For those of you who are celebrating Christmas, remember that when you sit down and exchange presents beneath the tree on December 25th, even though you may not be in Rome, you are doing exactly as the Romans did. As I mentioned at the end of last week, the show will be on hiatus next week as I am traveling for the holidays. But when I return, I hope to bring back with me a fancy new hosting server. As many of you have noted with frustration over the last few weeks, there have been many problems downloading episodes. At first, I didn't quite know what the problem was, but it dawned on me that the thousands and thousands of download requests were overwhelming my poor little free hosting account. When I started the history of Rome, I never imagined I would need more than hobbyist-grade hosting. But the audience has now officially outgrown the venue, and I plan on spending a good chunk of my downtime getting all the bugs worked out of what I hope to be a server with more than enough bandwidth to accommodate everyone out there now and anyone who wants to hop on board in the future. So I will see you next year, hopefully fully upgraded, so we can launch unobstructed into the Punic Wars, by far Rome's greatest test and a time of very real peril, and then begin to trace the long, slow decline of the Republic until the whirlpool begins to suck furiously downward in the middle of the first century B.C. Until then, I wish you all a happy feast of the unconquered sun. Hemisphere during late December, the days are at their shortest lengths and the nights are at their longest. For those of the pagan world, this has always been the greatest time of the year to celebrate and practice the works of darkness. The pagan calendar identifies this period as the winter solstice. It was during the pre Christian midwinter pagan celebrations of Scandinavia's Norsemen where today's Christmas traditions began. As a means of honoring the pagan sex and fertility god Yule, a 12-day celebration during the month of December was inaugurated. A large single log considered to be a phallic idol was lit on fire and kept burning for 12 days. Animal or human sacrifices were offered in the fire on each of those days. Wild, delirious reveling accompanied the daily sacrifices as drunken participants defiantly strove to make contact with spirits. A thousand miles away in pre-Christian Rome, celebrants were paying homage to their own gods during the winter solstice. Witchcraft traditions hold that a number of pagan gods were given birth during this period, including Dionysus, Attis, and Baal, chief male god of fertility and licentiousness. Another pagan god from Persia, identified as Mithra, was said to have been born specifically on December 25th. Mithra was the god of the unconquerable sun, the god of the light between heaven and earth, worshipped at that time by an influential Roman cult. His birth symbolized an end to the long nights and a return to the dominance of the sun. During the month-long winter solstice celebration, courts in Rome were closed. Any and all crimes were allowed. Homosexuality, cross-dressing, and uncontrolled debauchery reigned supreme. Rome's order was turned upside down. Even children were allowed to join in the drunken orgies as part of the juvenilia celebration.
By 270 AD, the Roman Emperor Aurelian had made it official, setting aside a seven-day period from December the 17th through the 24th, culminating in an exchange of gifts on December the 25th to celebrate the birth of the sun god. This Roman orgy to end all orgies later became known as Saturnalia, in honor of the god Saturn, the god of excess. Roman soldiers invading Britain brought with them their pagan orgiistic traditions. Upon taking root in England, Saturnalia became known as the Festival of Fools reigned over by the Lord of Misrule. By the 4th century, the influential government-sanctioned Church of Rome, unable to outlaw the growing number of pagan practices, chose instead to adopt them into their so-called official Christianity. The Church believed this would attract more pagans to their fold. Up until this time, the birthday of Jesus Christ, the Jewish Messiah, had not been celebrated at all. Ignoring scriptures, however, indicating that the birth probably did not occur during the winter, the church nevertheless confused biblical history and made Jesus' birthday coincide with the pagan god Mithra. The birth date of the sun god had now become the birth date of the son of God. It was hoped that the pagan celebrations of Saturnalia would merge into this new legally sanctioned form of Christianity. The church's practice of changing the dates of Christian events to coincide with pagan festivals continued, and by the 7th century, Pope Gregory I had ordered Augustine of Canterbury to incorporate any and all pagan practices and customs into the expanding Roman Catholic Church. During the Middle Ages, the debased Mardi Gras atmosphere of what was now known as Christ's Mass had reached a fevered pitch. Common practices included open sex in the streets, rioting, murder, and a number of pagan druidic Halloween rituals. This blood-drenched celebration got so out of hand that by 1652, following the execution of King Charles I, Christ's Mass was finally outlawed in England. A religious reform movement began sweeping the country led by Puritan Oliver Cromwell. The Puritans took the biblical mandate seriously which commanded that Christianity remain pure and separate from paganism. Despite their noble efforts, the celebration simply went underground and by 1656, after only four short years under the ban, the public's demand for the legalization of Christ's Mass had become insurmountable. The appointment of Charles II to the throne restored England's monarchy and with it the celebration of Christ's Mass. The Puritans had lost England, but they held high hopes for the new world. When the first settlers came from England, uh, they were, for the most part, Puritans. They came here for religious freedom. They came here to be free to worship God without a hierarchy and without the corruption of the organized church that they had known before. And uh, when they came, they came with the clear knowledge of the danger of these pagan practices that had become so dear to the hearts of uh, their ancestors. Following England's lead in 1659, the colonies of America had likewise outlawed Christmas. For 200 years, the clergy in New England battled to keep the riotous celebrations honoring the pagan god Saturn from infiltrating the New World. The Reverend Cotton Mather had warned in a Christmas Day sermon in 1712, Can you in your conscience think that your Holy Savior is honored by hard drinking, lewd reveling, and by a mass fit for none but Borcus or Saturn? But the public's taste for sin and revelry persisted. In 1828, gang rioting during the Saturnalia-like Christmas celebrations got so bad that cities such as New York were forced to institute a professional police force for the first time in order to control the savagery. Christmas was not only not widely celebrated, in many cases, uh, many places, Christmas celebrations were actually outlawed. And this was because of uh, the attitude of many of the churches who regarded it as primarily as a pagan celebration and as a reproach to the Lord. By the mid-19th century, American churches were the last remaining holdout 
in the war against the validation of Christmas. However, they too finally succumbed as a result of the efforts of the American Sunday School Society, who began advocating Christmas programs for children as a method of filling the pews. The Society argued that children could be taught about the birth of Christ through the reenactment of the Nativity. They also offered candy and treats to the children as a means of enticing families into accepting the holiday despite its notorious history and blatantly pagan roots. The successful technique of bribing children with candy would later be used on an unsuspecting American populace in the effort to promote the acceptance of the pagan rituals of Halloween. However, it was the work of England's most popular writer Charles Dickens whose ghostly 1843 book a Christmas Carol cemented the Christmas holiday in the hearts of Americans forever. Dickens' well-loved story made the pagan Christmas feasts, shining trees, glittering shops, and family warmth irresistible to those wanting to experience the holiday. Coming to America in 1867 to promote his work, Charles Dickens packed theaters as he read his story to cheering audiences around the country. A Christmas carol gripped America and destroyed any final attempt to stop the evolution of Christmas. By 1875, the Puritans had been beaten, and by 1890, all American states had voted to make Christmas a legal holiday. Today's tradition of the Christmas Yule Log stems directly from the worship of the pre-Christian Scandinavian fertility god Yule. The burning of this phallic idol is also responsible for the concept of the 12 days of Christmas, which represented the 12 daily sacrifices offered up in the Yule Log's flames. Another uh, good example of the um, pagan elements of Christmas is the whole concept of Yule and the Yule Log. The, uh, the very term is derived from a uh, uh, Norse god, Yule, spelled J-U-L. And uh, uh, every year around Christmas time, uh, a huge log was uh, uh, cut down and uh, fashioned into a uh, fertility symbol and then burned uh, for 12 days. And on each successive day, a, a, a new sacrifice to the god Yule was performed uh, uh, in the fire, and a new sacrificial victim was, uh, was burned to death. Uh, sometimes, but not always, the sacrificial victims were uh, human beings. And the whole uh, notion of the 12 days of Christmas also comes to us from this uh, Norse pagan tradition. In an attempt to blur the origins of this horrific ritual, the Church of Rome placed the first day of the Mass of Christ on December 25th and the 12th day on January the 6th. Despite no scriptural references for January the 6th, it was selected as the day the wise men supposedly arrived to offer gifts to the newborn Christ. This day then has become known as Epiphany. During the Dark Ages, the European custom of putting an oil-lighted wick lamp in the windows during the 12 days of Christmas signified to neighbors that the occupants were participating in the pagan worship of the phallic idol Yule. In today's commercialism, this is where we get the tradition of decorating our houses with Christmas lights. The Yule log custom was originally brought over to America by Scandinavian immigrants during the 1600s. And despite attempts to ban the tradition, it has stayed with us to this very day. Today, when we wish someone Yuletide greetings, we are in a sense invoking the power of the fertility god Yule upon that person. Saturnalia celebrations, holly and other greens were hung over doorways as part of a pagan ritual to ward off evil. To deck the halls with boughs of holly was to acknowledge the powers of the nature gods. According to Wiccan rituals, placing holly or other greens in the shape of a circle or wreath accentuated its magical power. Similarly, mistletoe, when used in the casting of Wiccan or Druidic spells, could render a woman helpless and open to sexual exploitation. This is where we get our custom of hanging mistletoe in doorways today 
and if a woman is caught underneath, she may be kissed and must not resist. The fir tree, uh, the mistletoe, uh, all of these things uh, typically uh, are uh, come from uh, uh, overtly uh, pagan traditions, uh, in, typically in, from Northern Europe, German, Norse, and uh, English. Likewise, evergreen trees have always represented sex and fertility in pagan cultures. During the winter solstice, trees would be chopped down, brought inside, set up, and decorated as idols for worship. The Christmas tree was regarded uh, as, a, as a sacred tree. Uh, the, uh, the pagans of Northern Europe uh, t typically uh, worshipped trees. They uh, regarded trees uh, and groves as sacred. So uh, uh, the bringing of the uh, tree into the house would be a way of uh, bringing this uh, supernatural uh, source of blessing uh, into your home. That was, that was the whole idea that there were, there were spirits uh, who resided in the trees. In the Middle Ages, the tradition of the winter solstice Christmas tree primarily took root in Germany. During his reign, King George I, himself of German extraction, brought the custom to Victorian England. German immigrants settling in Pennsylvania did the same in America during the early 1800s. In 1848, the London Illustrated News published this famous engraving depicting Queen Victoria and her royal family beside a decorated Christmas tree. And within a few years, nearly every English household had their own tree in allegiance to the monarchy. By 1900, the U.S. Forest Service estimated that at least one in five homes in America had adopted the Christmas tree tradition. Thousands of years earlier, God, speaking through the prophet Jeremiah, warned against this pagan practice in the Old Testament. Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the ways of the heathen, for the customs of the people are vain. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest, they deck it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and hammers that it move not. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, neither also is it in them to do good. Santa Claus is another uh, good example of a pagan element of, of Christmas. Santa Claus, as we know him today, is a, uh, an amalgamation of several different traditions. But uh, in most cultures throughout the world, uh, you will find the existence of what is known as hearth gods, uh, gods who uh, guard uh, the hearth and the chimney and keep the fires burning and make sure the food cooks properly and the people are warm and what have you. And at a certain time of year, uh, in the middle of winter, typically, uh, the hearth god dressed in red will come down the chimney to reward those who uh, have pleased him during the course of the previous year and to uh, lay uh, curses or hexes or other forms of uh, tr uh, punishment upon uh, people who have displeased him. The concept of Santa Claus has had a long and winding history with a number of diverse cultures contributing to the composite character we have today. Beginning once again in Scandinavia, Santa's original incarnation was in the form of Odin, the pagan god of thunder. A tall fellow with a long flowing beard who inhabited the spirit-infested Nordic forests. Odin would travel the sky during the winter solstice deciding who would die and who would prosper. Most believers were frightened of this particular time of year. In England, Odin eventually evolved into Father Christmas, who, crowned with sprigs of holly, traveled to the countryside getting roaring drunk as part of the Festival of Fools celebration. Frequently he would be accompanied by a horned goat, ironically the biblical symbol of those who reject the salvation of Jesus Christ. According to the traditions of the Church of Rome, there was a Turkish bishop named Nicholas who hailed from Myra in Asia Minor during the fourth century. He was known as the patron saint of seafaring men. Over the centuries, as the legend began to unfold, it was rumored that St. Nicholas had actually captured the devil himself, put him in chains, and made him his personal servant. Recognized in various cultures as Krampus, Beelzebub, or Zwart Piet, Black Peter, this assistant of St. Nicholas is best known by his German name, Necht Ruprecht. 
Described as a hideous horned creature, the servant Ruprecht was a dark and sinister figure who stood in stark contrast to the saintly Nicholas. Somehow, Father Christmas's companion, the horned goat, had metamorphosized into the foreboding horned devil called Ruprecht. As St. Nicholas traveled from house to house, inquiring about the behavior of children, Ruprecht would drop candy and gifts down the chimney into the good children's shoes which had been placed there. It was from this story that we get our tradition of hanging stockings on the mantle at Christmas time. If able to recite a verse or demonstrate a skill for St. Nicholas, the child would receive a gift. If unable to remember a verse or if the child had been bad, he or she would receive a switch or a whip. Ruprecht also carried a large sack which he would frequently use to haul away the really bad boys and girls. As more and more Christian churches began combining the pagan rituals of the winter solstice with the celebration of the birth of Christ, emphasis on St. Nicholas's role began to shift. Some cultures began to downplay the role of St. Nicholas, but surprisingly retained Ruprecht. Eventually, Necht Ruprecht was made the companion and servant to the Christ child himself. In this scenario, the devil is actually given the title Venoxman, or Santa Claus. 19th century writer Theodore Storm in his story about Necht Ruprecht even goes so far as to describe the switches given to the children by Ruprecht as tools to be used in sadomasochistic rituals. Soon the image of Ruprecht would fade from the Christmas tradition but not his sadistic influence. Many of the early depictions of Santa Claus portrayed him not as a jolly gift giver but of an unfriendly disciplinarian complete with a ready switch or whip. One of the problems with the Christmas gift thing for children is that it really is a religious teaching, a wrong religious teaching, because it teaches them that if they're nice, they get the gifts. If they're naughty, they don't. Or in my case, I was taught that he would leave us a bundle of switches. Uh, isn't that interesting? Uh, it's a salvation by uh, my own personal virtue. But, but there's a second thing wrong with it, and that is that they're going to get those gifts whether they're naughty or nice, because most parents love their children and, and won't, wouldn't dream of, quote, ruining their Christmas, and they're not going to ruin Christmas, they're going to give those children the gifts anyway, and some, sooner or later those thinking children are going to realize, I wasn't very nice, but I got the gift anyway. So it isn't important to be nice, it isn't important to do what is right and avoid what is wrong. German immigrants coming to America during the 1620s tried to influence the New World with the stories of St. Nicholas and his gift-giving companion, Necht Ruprecht. But somehow the idea just didn't take hold until almost 200 years later. In 1819, America's best-selling author, Washington Irving, used his influence to promote St. Nicholas in a popular Christmas story titled Brace Bridge Hall. Consulting Irving's writings, Episcopalian minister Clement Clark Moore penned a decidedly secular tale called A Visit from St. Nicholas in 1822. Later retitled The Night Before Christmas, Moore's poem was based on the tales of German and Dutch immigrants who had come to America. Intended originally only for his own children, Moore's story was published in the Troy Sentinel in New York and became an overnight sensation. Gone were the bishop's remnant of St. Nicholas. He was now a jolly old elf imbued with supernatural powers. Moore had also replaced Nicholas's companion, the horned necked Ruprecht, with eight horned magical reindeer. As the popularity of the night before Christmas grew, Moore became increasingly concerned that the story's emphasis on the supernatural and its disregard for Christ would reflect poorly on his position as a minister. As a result, he refused to take credit for its creation until the story became so popular that he could no longer resist. Forty years later, illustrator Thomas Nast, political cartoonist for Harper's Weekly, seared the image of Santa Claus into the minds of the world by creating a drawing which combined Moore's jolly old elf with images of St. Nicholas taken from his own native Bavaria. By 1880, Santa was a thoroughly secularized folk hero who had become increasingly irresistible to retailers worldwide. 
One factor that has contributed to uh, the paganization of Christmas, the complete paganization of Christmas, has been the element of commercialism. Uh, it may seem odd to think of it in that context, but uh, remember that Christ himself identified the love of money as a spiritual force in and of itself. And where it comes into play, it has a kind of naturally hostile effect on, uh, on the gospel and the, uh, uh, the Christian faith. So the commercialization of Christmas has helped to h highlight the pagan elements and to uh, drive the overtly Christian elements further underground. To me, the most obscene thing about Christmas celebrations and customs as we know them is that as a result of these things, Jesus is displaced in the hearts of children by Santa Claus. The love, affection, appreciation, trust, the, the desire to emulate these things that they should have in their hearts and minds as growing children for Jesus himself, to whom they owe everything. Uh, instead, this has been stolen. This has been uh, raped out of their hearts, in a sense, and displaced by the myth of Santa Claus. He takes the place of God or of Jesus Christ in the special world that is Christmas. Uh, he has supernatural knowledge of, uh, of your history. He has supernatural knowledge of, uh, of your present, of your attitudes. He's keeping a list. He knows who's naughty and nice. Your parents don't even know that. Uh, he's obviously got some, uh, some conduit to knowledge that is uh, beyond the human. Uh, and he, uh, he flies through the air. Uh, he was capable of visiting every place on the globe in the course of a single night. In many, many ways, Santa exhibits supernatural qualities that uh, provide a kind of a surrogate deity or a substitute for, uh, for God or for Christ. Myths, by definition, evolve and change and things are added. Uh, we, we used to have a Santa Claus figure uh, that was confused with Saint Nicholas and confused with other pagan figures. And then somehow he evolved through the drawings of Thomas Nast and others into what we see today, but he had a sleigh with eight supernatural reindeer that can fly. And so the, the Christmas traditions that are pagan continue to change. But the truth of Jesus, the truth of the incarnation, the truth that the word was made flesh and dwelt among us never changes, never will. Various scriptures in the Bible, including the second chapter of Luke, record the events surrounding the birth of the Messiah. A decree from Caesar Augustus had gone out, requiring all people to return to the city of their origin for taxation purposes. Mary, who was pregnant with a child conceived by the Holy Spirit, made the difficult journey to Bethlehem along with her husband Joseph. Both Joseph and Mary were of the lineage of King David. Upon arrival, they found all the inns to be full, but were provided with a stable where Mary could have her baby. At the same time, an angel announcing the birth of the Messiah appeared to shepherds tending their flocks in a field nearby. The stunned shepherds hurried to Bethlehem and found the baby Jesus lying in a manger just as the angel had declared. Although traditional nativity scenes placed three wise men at the stable at the time of Jesus Christ's birth, According to scripture, these wise men visited Jesus later at his home. Because three gifts are named, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, tradition says three men gave them. But exactly how many wise men visited Jesus is not known. The birth of Jesus Christ miraculously fulfilled a number of Old Testament prophecies about the coming Messiah, including that he would be born in Bethlehem, that he would be born of a virgin, and that he would be a descendant of King David's. The, the concept or the idea of celebrating the birth of Jesus once a year had apparently never occurred to the church fathers. In the first three centuries of the church's history, there was no such thing. And I think God perhaps very carefully avoided telling us in the scriptures when he was born. We can be sure of one thing, it wasn't in late December, and uh, because in the first place shepherds don't abide by their flocks in the fields by night in late December. It's too cold. They take them out in the morning to pasture, uh, uh, protect them while they eat all day, and then bring them back in at night. So it wasn't in late December. <clears throat> it, it, 
it's an interesting thing and perhaps uh, an intellectually uh, tantalizing thought to try to figure out when he was born. And it can be done uh, within limits. And uh, if it mattered, and apparently it doesn't matter to God, it probably, he was probably born in late September. Some scholars point out that according to scripture, the birth of Jesus may have taken place in the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles or September 29th. Ironically, this would have placed his conception right around December 25th. The timing of other events such as the temple service of Zacharias and the pregnancy of Mary's cousin Elizabeth lend credence to December 25th as being the date of Jesus' conception. Since Christians believe that life begins at conception anyway, and not at birth as pro-abortionists believe, this may be a more appropriate reason to remember this time of the year as the period in which God came to earth in human form. For some, Christmas today simply means a time to get together as a family. For pagans, it is a deeply religious time to celebrate the winter solstice. Retailers, of course, view it with eyes towards making huge profits. Others use this time to reflect on the birth or conception of Jesus Christ, while many parents use Christmas to perpetuate the myth of Santa Claus to their children. In order to carry on this myth of Santa Claus, we must lie to our children. We must deceive them. We literally must lie to our children. And one of the wonderful things about children is that they naturally believe everything that we tell them when they're small. They trust us to tell them the truth. And if we deceive them in this way, it has to be destructive because at some point in their future lives, they're going to wonder if other things we told them were true. The things we told them about the Lord, were they really true? It plants the seeds of doubt. And anyway, it creates disappointment. It creates disillusionment. To my mind, the question is not so much whether to celebrate Christmas or even how to celebrate Christmas, but to be able to make any decision knowledgeably. Whether you celebrate it or you don't celebrate it, you should know why you're doing so. You should understand what the pagan roots of Christmas are, and with that knowledge, you can discount them or ignore them if you choose to do so. It is not the purpose of this film to tell you which Christmas rituals should and should not be practiced by you and your family. This is between you and the Lord. What Christians should be most concerned about, however, are the growing pagan influences infiltrating every area of our rapidly degenerating society. Recently, we took our cameras to the Nevada desert where we witnessed 35,000 pagans from around the country participating in a week-long celebration of sex, drugs, and hedonism. Here, everything was permissible and encouraged except for the adoration of Jesus Christ. In nearly every ritual performed, Christianity was mercilessly mocked and despised. Each year, the numbers of participants continues to grow. Its attraction is expanding worldwide as it recruits through the Internet. It is sobering to witness what could be the wave of the future unfolding before our eyes. It is not only permitted uh, in the public schools, in the government schools, to celebrate holidays. It is encouraged and in some uh, instances required, but with this, uh, with this uh, uh, condition, they must be pagan. They must not be Christian. And Christmas time, they are, they are certainly encouraged to put on Christmas programs and Christmas plays, uh, but all references to Jesus, all references to the gospel, all references to the incarnation, all references to God must be omitted. They sing about Santa Claus, they sing about Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, and God only knows what else they sing about that isn't scriptural. Since the pagan elements in Christmas are so strong, and they provide virtually the, the entirety of the structure and the content of the holiday, there is no Christian element in the holiday, therefore uh, it becomes the ideal uh, politically correct, culturally diverse, uh, multicultural holiday uh, for, for everyone. In the 17th chapter of John, Jesus taught that it was appropriate for his followers to be in the world, but not of the world, meaning that we should be involved in our world so as to have a positive influence, but not become corrupted by it. The mighty Joshua, in challenging his people, said, Now therefore fear the Lord, and serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the other gods which your fathers served. 
Choose you this day whom ye will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the